Welcome to uh, the Computers and Society Lecture Series. My name is Evan Porth. I'm particularly psyched for this talk. Um, Susan Crawford, who was uh, previously Special Assistant to the President uh, for Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy, will be speaking about um, the state of telecommunications policy and hopefully a little bit about her upcoming book. Um, she's currently um, Professor at Cardozo Law School and a visiting research collaborator at Princeton Center for Information Technology Policy. Uh, she's also a friend of mine. I, I, I'm often, I often say I have the best job in the world, and usually when I say that, I'm talking about the fact that I get to hang out with uh, some of my smart, um, uh, my, some of my smart students. But the other side of that is I get to meet really interesting people. I first met Susan in 2005. Uh, when she was an ICANN board member, and uh, in 2006, actually, we got friendly when she launched an organization called One Web Day, which is an organization like Earth Day that's dedicated towards educating people about the uh, important issues um, involving the internet and also keeping an, an open web. And uh, she's just do done some great work. And uh, you know, over the years, she's pl played lots of roles in my life, including advising me, mentoring me, and. Uh, and being a friend to me, so it's it's it, 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 I'm really psyched to introduce her. And uh, without further ado, Susan Crawford. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here, and that was a terrific introduction. And it's great to be back in New York. Students here. Um, so let me start with a story. Uh, a couple weekends ago, I went to see Inside Job. How many of you have seen Inside Job? Raise your hand. Like three people. All right, it's just, it's down at the Angelica. It's not very far away. And you should really uh, take it in if you get a chance. Um, and it's the story of you know, how a bunch of extraordinarily wealthy bankers, uh, well funded economists, and an entire lobbying industry, really, uh, found a way to avoid any supervision by the federal government for years. And uh, it really was the result, this effort of uh, decades of dismantling the idea that government plays any role in creating a level playing field for all Americans. This idea began to fall into disrepute intentionally. I have lots of books on this subject, uh, but especially back when Lewis Powell uh, in, wrote a very important white paper <coughs> Um, that was dedicated at showing that really the free market could solve all regulatory problems and the United States had swung far too much in the direction of uh, regulatory structures for important industries. Um, so the banking industry, the movie depicts, has a lot of money and a lot of influence on Capitol Hill. Another source of the banking industry's power is that they put people in key positions in Washington. And uh, executives become fundraisers who can take on senior roles in any administration. There's a constant flow of people, the movie depicts, between the businesses, the banks mostly, and the agencies in Washington, just a constant revolving door. And so important decisions about regulations are being made by officials who share the cultural mindset of the industry that they're regulating. And, not just the mindset, they've also worked in that industry for much of their career. A core problem in regulation of any basic industry in America is whether the regulator is going to uh, actually operate on the industry or will be captured by that industry. Um, capture doesn't imply that regulators are corrupt at all. It merely suggests that uh, they share a worldview and an approach to difficult problems with the industry they oversee and the preferences of the industry they oversee. And particularly, the movie shows that all the relevant data is often outside the banking, industry, uh, the banking agencies. The, the industry has the data, agencies don't have anything. They're operating often in the dark. And so inside job really documents this confluence, this, this notion that perspectives and opinions between the banking sector and Washington became one. And that's far more powerful than mere corruption. This isn't about paying people off directly. 
it's a cultural comfort, an agreement with an approach to the world where Wall Street's positions really became the consensus view in Washington. Alan Greenspan, one of the most respected men in the country um, during the Clinton administration, is depicted in the movie. And he's often uh, advancing the theory that we really need a hands-off regulatory policy. Great faith in financial innovation will outweigh any interest in regulating the financial industry. And he'll say things like, these derivative transactions are deals among professionals and should be left there. There's a great moment in the movie when Raghuram Raghun comes forward. He was interviewed in, the, in 2005, having written a big paper about uh, whether or not deregulation increased rather than decreased risk in the financial system. And he was met with a torrent of attacks in 2005 for writing this paper, um, viewed as just being dumped, actually, by the people in the, in the room who all thought that self-regulation is preferable to any government oversight because regulation would risk undermining investment in banking and financial stability. All of this private shared worldview was also accompanied, as depicted in this terrific movie, by a very seductive lifestyle. Lots and lots of money being made, big parties, um, really enjoyable life, particularly here in New York where life gets quite expensive and uh, extraordinarily high compensation. A major test of Wall Street's power in the last few years has been whether or not uh, these customized derivative contracts should be regulated at all. And the notion was that these are customized contracts. Two parties are actually playing, placing bets on market movements, trying to see where things are going to go. And they're very exotic, customized, uh, algorithmic instruments that are hard, in fact, for people to understand. Congress took up the issue, bills were introduced, and in response, the industry lobbying machine swung into action. So when in 1998, Brooks Lee Bourne, who was then the chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, uh, Brooks Lee Bourne wanted to introduce a concept paper, not a regulation, just a concept paper, suggesting that it might be good to worry about whether or not these exotic derivative instruments were having a negative effect on the global economy. Uh, there was a tremendous boiling up market in these things, um, tumultuous marketplace, really. And there was absolutely no regulatory oversight of the derivatives market. So in the movie, one of Bourne's lieutenants says that there was a moment when Brooksley Bourne got a phone call from the deputy secretary of the uh, Treasury Department saying, I have 13 bankers in my office, and they tell me that if you release this paper, we're going to plunge into the worst financial crisis since World War II. Right? So Brooksley Bourne, she actually ends up issuing the paper, but the entire regulatory effort is quashed by enormous lobbying push on Capitol Hill, who say that there should be no role for government in overseeing this healthy, self-regulated private marketplace. And of course, the failure to regulate not only derivatives, but other exotic um, financial instruments made possible a decade-long financial bubble, which burst and made it now actually quite, uh, ultimately created the worst financial crisis and deepest recession the world has seen since World War II. Something that's making it difficult for the students here to find jobs. Uh, students all over the world are having trouble finding jobs these years. And since then, since then, since the Obama administration took office, there's been no serious consideration of uh, real financial regulation that would have, would affect this kind of marketplace. No serious attempt to break up these gigantic banks or reform financial regulation, even though it's possible now, or certainly was possible until we lost the House recently. Um, reform has been put off, and the biggest banks have gotten bigger. Notice that major front page story on Wall Street bonuses uh, that are being paid out this year. Came out, I think, in last week's, uh, one of last week's papers. Money is flowing again. The lifestyle is back. And there has been no serious effort to change the situation. In telecom policy, you don't get very many big moments like that Brooks Lee Bourne phone call, which now seems like such a tipping point. 
But we have some incremental moments that have gone by in the last few years. And I, I think I can seize now on a few, a few turning points uh, that we've hit in the last decade and are about to hit this fall and winter in telecom policy that will have a similar uh, portent for the future of the internet and the future of telecommunications policy in this country. We know that the situation here in the United States isn't that great when it comes to high-speed internet access service. We know that the country is drifting on any index. We're never in the top 10. Our, our speeds are relatively slower. Costs are much higher um, than in other developed nations. Um, we know that although uh, broadband access, or as I prefer to call it, high-speed internet access is a fundamental engine for economic growth for all the startups you guys are going to build that don't want permission from somebody else before you can launch, uh, we know that it's going to be an engine for assisting healthcare and education and energy efforts in this country, and we know we're not doing very well. More than 30% of American households don't have high-speed internet access at all. And in the country that invented the internet, we've, we're really failing to leap ahead and capitalize on uh, the advantage we once held for our own economic strength. So here's some sharp moments in telecommunications history. The first one of uh, recent vintage was the complete deregulation of high-speed internet access in 2002 by the Bush Federal Communications Commission. Um, it, and they followed that up uh, in actions in 2005 as well. So they, they started off with cable modems, and then they deregulated uh, DSL, <coughs> and they deregulated wireless internet access. So right now, those services are subject to absolutely no regulatory oversight. There is no structure that would constrain pricing, discrimination, uh, that would make it possible for all, all Americans to have access to high-speed internet um, services. None of that now exists, certainly not any effort to make it affordable for Americans. Um, so that was a big moment there back in 2002. Also in 2003, uh, a huge step taken to eliminate the idea of line sharing. Um, we, it's very expensive to build these uh, pipes for the internet. Uh, the uh, high upfront costs make this really a natural monopoly service. So we've had the idea for about 100 years that it makes sense to share facilities, um, to have an initial investment made into the uh, infrastructure and then to allow other people to share it as they need to. That ended in 2003, again, under the Bush FCC. So no obligation to lease lines to competitive carriers that might provide cheaper, faster, internet access using their own innovative techniques. So that's our first moment, deregulation. That was big. That's a sort of like the Brooksley Bourne phone call. Another one, key moments, I think, for telecommunications policy in this country was the election of Barack Obama. There was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and excitement in the tech community, in the uh, group of people who've been worried about our failure in broadband internet access over the preceding years. I, uh, Obama issued a terrific um, policy statement in November 2007, his platform for technology and innovation. And the very first substantive paragraph of that policy said uh, that, I've uh, even got the words here, Barack Obama supports the basic principle that network providers should not be allowed to charge fees to privilege the content or applications of some websites and internet applications over others. This uh, principle will ensure that new competitors have the same opportunity as incumbents. There's sort of an exhalation, uh, real joy almost, uh, you'd have to say, in the tech sector that somebody who understood these principles had been elevated to the presidency. He also said that he would reduce the influence of lobbyists, certainly not hire any into his administration, and push for fact-based decision making. The idea at the onset of the Obama administration is that we would bring broadband to all Americans at reasonable prices, that we would be second to none in adoption and deployment of the fastest high-speed internet access around the world, 
um, that we would preserve the value of the open internet as an engine for economic growth, and that we would use high-speed internet access as a tool to achieve all the other important economic goals that the country had. So now there are two more moments coming uh, this winter, and um, maybe one will go into January, but uh, certainly this winter. The first one is the Comcast decision in April of this year. We'll talk about that. And moment four is, from my perspective, the Comcast-NBCU merger, about which I'm writing a book right now, and the reaction to that. So a little background for those of you who haven't been following all the details. Um, the DC Circuit in April of this year uh, said that having deregulated, with one hand, high-speed internet access back in 2002, that Brooks Lee Bourne moment for the telecommunications industry, uh, we could not then, with the other hand, say, but we've retained power to tell Comcast that blocking BitTorrent is unreasonable. DC Circuit says, how, you, you know, you don't have any legal basis for saying that. If you deregulate these actors by labeling them as information services, I'll go into that in a second, you can't then turn around and say you have an obligation to manage your network reasonably. No jurisdiction. From the 1970s on, uh, the country has been worried about the power of these very few carriers to constrain innovation by new computing services, to use their gatekeeper control over transport communications to say yes or no to um, new services that could be introduced on using telephone lines. So uh, back starting in the 70s and 80s, there were a few proceedings at the Federal Communications Commission that said, we're going to keep carriers in the business of providing a basic transport service for all Americans. And if they're ever going to offer what we'll call enhanced services, they have to do it in a non-discriminatory fashion, be open to all comers. And the commission actually worked quite hard to define what that basic service would be that carriers would have to resell on a non-discriminatory basis and relied on the existence of this resale regime to justify non-regulation of everything else. We're going to regulate the basic transport and use it as a substrate for every other kind of innovation that's made possible using these devices, new computers, and uh, new ways of using the network. And this same distinction between transport on the one hand and enhanced services or content on the other stays in place through the 1984 divestiture of, of AT&T and the 1996 Communications Act. So you've got a sort of unbroken path of keeping basic transport in place, enhanced services running above it. When access to the commercial internet first becomes possible, and you remember when that is, 1995, uh, we turn over the idea of using the internet protocol from just academics and uh, non-commercial services and allow commercial actors on. Uh, the providers of the access to the internet were separate entities. We used to call them internet service providers. And they were allowed to connect to the carrier's <coughs> lines because the carriers were regulated. And we had six or seven thousand of them uh, during that period. And uh, we kept the underlying providers of transmission regulated as property carriers and chose not to regulate the ISPs, right? ISPs are enhanced, they're special, and the, the basic transport we leave regulated. Um, when telephone companies started providing access to the internet uh, over their own copper wires using high-speed uh, DSL services, access, they were, they were still treated like common carriers. They had to, this is like techno uh, telecom talk, they had to unbundle the high speed portion of the copper line and allow anybody to get access to that. They had to allow, again, thousands of ISPs to share the copper lines and provide people access to the internet. Um, so it's before 2002, internet access was provided on a non-discriminatory competitive basis to everybody in America. Now, it may have been slow, but it was non-discriminatory. Because DSL these days is not that fast. And I'll get to the end of this story uh, in a moment. Um, when cable modem service was introduced, the cable company said, we don't want to be treated like old-fashioned telephone companies. What we're doing actually is one integrated service. Uh, they claimed that cable modem service combined both transmission and internet access. And the court strongly disagreed. Ninth Circuit said, no, no, 
What you're doing is what we've seen for 100 years. This is basic transport service. It should be regulated. It should be kept in place as something that lots of competitive providers can use. And then after the Ninth Circuit spoke in 2002, the FCC took this radical deregulatory move over here that I've described, which is to say, all right, uh, we believe that cable modem service is somehow uh, fancy, enhanced, not a common carriage service. In essence, the cable providers succeeded in deregulating themselves by not offering a basic transport service to Americans and not having a history of doing it. They said, we shouldn't be subject to the same rules. We should be allowed to discriminate any time we want to. Uh, in the past, we could only get internet access over a telephone call and the, uh, the basic transport was always there. Cable said, that doesn't apply to us. So uh, the FCC declared that because telephone companies have been treated as common carriers historically, they were in fact telecommunications providers, but because cable guys had never been subject to that same regime, they could avoid regulation by continuing to refuse to provide transmission services, effectively deregulating themselves. I want to make this point a couple of times. So um, commission defines cable ISPs as an information service, enhanced, not basic. And the Supreme Court upheld this, deferred to the commission's authority in 2005 in a case called Brand X. Justice Scalia was furious about this. He issues a scathing dissent saying, look, after all is said and done, after all the regulatory cant has been discarded and the smoke of agency expertise blown away, it remains perfectly clear that someone who sells cable modem services offering telecommunications, in essence, the commission overtaken by this zeal for deregulation that was sweeping the country in 2002, uh, decided that it would just stand on its head and understand what cable providers were doing as something completely different from everything that had come before. But nevertheless, the majority had spoken, and that's where we were with the Supreme Court after 2005. And uh, the commission says, uh, you know, this is a special fancy schmancy enhanced service, no longer basic. Then when Comcast started blocking uh, BitTorrent back in 2007, uh, Kevin Martin, the then FCC commissioner, decided he hated the cable companies. He wanted to go after them and stop that blocking, uh, saying it was unreasonable but didn't really have any jurisdiction to do so. So he says, don't worry, I have ancillary jurisdiction, which means even though I've deregulated all these actors, I've retained some pool of reserve power and I get to act anyway. And the problem is that you can only exercise ancillary jurisdiction if there's a statutory provision that you can point to that you say you're, you're assisting by exercising jurisdiction. So this is a really screwy position for a regulator to be in to say when you're acting with respect to high-speed internet access, you're doing it in order to support something else, maybe telephone service or cable service. Um, and it involves a lot of trick shots. I happened to see yesterday the ESPN competition for trick billiards. So this sort of ancillary jurisdiction is just like that. It's like you have a rack and you have to get the cue ball to go over it and hop and then jump and then come around in the corner. Same idea, really circuitous way of finding power uh, in this notion of ancillary jurisdiction. So it's that that the DC Circuit found to be completely unfounded uh, back in April 2010, which knocked the uh, FCC's jurisdiction over high-speed internet access into the air. So why am I telling you this long story? Because uh, the, the current FCC has the opportunity to correct the mistake of the Bush FCC, to say, we got it wrong in 2002. We assumed that competition would emerge between DSL and cable modem service that would keep costs down and would take the place of any need to regulate. We also assumed that ISPs were giving their users lots of extra services like email or you know, DNS service. It turns out that's, that's not the case, that Americans actually buy internet access service for speed and price. That's what everybody cares about, not the extra services. So this commission back uh, in April had the opportunity to say, no, we're going to relabel these services as basic transport and give us some <coughs> solid regulatory you know, foothold for saying anything about high-speed internet access, for saying anything about deep packet inspection, 
for saying anything about service to all Americans at reasonable prices, for saying anything about public safety, and in particular, for saying anything about non-discrimination. It's only going to be possible to take these actions if you've got some jurisdictional authority. So uh, the commission didn't want to uh, be too forward with this, but did say, a sort of a tightrope walking attempt, uh, that they suggested that well, the country should follow something called the third way. The third way would be uh, adopting the, the, the former label, calling these things basic telecommunication services, but refraining in advance from being too heavy handed in the regulation from, for example, imposing price controls, uh, but retaining the power to say something about privacy, universal service, and other um, sort of central consumer protection needs for high-speed internet access. There was a firestorm, I think it's fair to say, um, an enormous <coughs> lobbying effort carried out by the telecommunications companies uh, who really will stop at nothing in the personal pressure. They're, they'll put it on people inside the government. Uh, enormous pressure put on Congress people who rely on the communications companies for campaign contributions. An enormous pressure put on the White House uh, so that it would not, you know, to say, look, if you do this relabeling, you're gonna be viewed as bad for business. And that's the last thing you guys want. Uh, this will be seen as regulating the internet. Got to watch out for that. By the way, if anybody ever tells you this is about regulating the internet, stop them in their tracks and says, no, this is all about regulating the basic access, transport, not the communications and the content that flow over that basic transport. Those are two different things. Uh, but anyway, fervid opposition. Absolutely fervid opposition after the release of the Third Way paper. And uh, 74 confused Democrats signed a letter uh, on the Hill uh, that had been granted, uh, drafted by Gene Green, um, saying, well, I don't think we should regulate the internet. Don't go regulate the internet. And uh, you know, lots of troops marched on the FCC. And uh, they even said, look, this is unprecedented. Unprecedented um, authority being exerted over the internet. Don't let this happen. Tea Party took. Um, you know, broadband regulation is one of their big <coughs> topics, probably prodded on by the telecommunications companies. And it's really only fair to point out that if the commission adopted this third way, it would just be rolling back the clock eight years to where we were in 2002 before we took the sharp deregulatory turn. And studies, lots of studies, say um, these regulatory proposals will dampen investment, Americans will lose their jobs, you know, planes will fall from the sky if we take any step, even think about, even think about regulating high-speed internet access. So, um, you know, that, it's a leaky boat uh, to go any direction other than uh, reclassifying these services. You could do the, the billiards trick shot of uh, ancillary jurisdiction where you're constantly trying to find some source for your authority in another part of the act. Uh, or you could just say, we're, you know, we're regulating this industry because it's essential to Americans and uh, right now it operates with no supervision whatsoever. So we'll see what the commission does. We'll see what the commission does. If the chairman doesn't use the three votes he has right now to reclassify high-speed internet access, it will be very disappointing because one of these moments for telecommunications policy was the election of Barack Obama. Um, the overall regulatory framework for saying anything about high-speed internet access is now in doubt. And so every time the commission tries to say anything about these services, they'll have to come up with some other authority. If the chairman doesn't do this, it will be a stunning Lucy with a football moment for telecommunications policy. Um, there are lots of people who've been working for years to correct the mistakes of the Bush regime. And remember that Lucy is arguably on Charlie's team, right? They're both on the same team, and yet it's surprising that she's always yanking the football. Um, another big moment, and the last one I want to cover today, it's coming up uh, for approval likely in January, is the Comcast NBCU merger. And um, a little background on this one. I'll start with another story. Back in March uh, 2010, the city of Alexandria received a letter from Verizon. And Alexandria, uh, which is in Virginia, right near Washington, had been uh, negotiating with Verizon to have them bring files to Alexandria. 
and they'd given them a cable franchise, and they were working on the deal to get them in, into town, and Verizon wrote to them and said, I'm sorry, we're not going to expand um, our Fios service anywhere into Alexandria. At the same time, they also announced, we're not going to expand in Baltimore, Boston, and a host of other areas around America. Just one week later, the Federal Communications Commission rolled out its national broadband plan, right? And the plan was based on the assumption that broadband is a foundation for economic growth, and we're going to lay out a bold roadmap for America's future, and makes a lot of detailed recommendations, most of which have to do with spectrum policy and universal service. Um, the plan did not discuss competition policy or market structures in America for high-speed internet access. And there are probably good reasons for that. Um, the commission didn't want to take on the issue of net neutrality in the broadband plan uh, because it wanted to be seen as charting a future for high-speed internet access and not get dragged down in this tussle over neutrality. And they also were not eager to address the market structure for high-speed internet access. To the extent there's ever humor in telecommunications <coughs> policy, the coincident timing of these two things is actually funny. Because as Verizon backs out of providing file service to Alexandria and other areas of the country, the cable monopoly steps in. And here's why. DSL service, uh, dividing up the copper line, cannot compete with what the cable providers are capable of. Uh, cable can upgrade its electronics pretty cheaply to, to very fast service. Um, and DSL, you have to dig up the streets to put in fiber. The only kind of competition that would actually work with respect to the cable guys is files. And yet, less than 10% of Americans will actually have access to files in, uh, in the foreseeable future because Wall Street is not interested in seeing that investment being made by Verizon. So, um, the FCC, even in the plan, said, look, uh, we're a little worried about this because it appears that for the speeds you need to watch video, which is the future of a lot of things we're going to be doing online, including uh, you know, real-time video conferences with each other, so we don't have to, I don't have to show up here, you can just see me on the screen. Um, for a lot of those applications, only cable will be able to provide you with the speeds you need, no other players. And here's another fact. The major cable providers don't compete with each other. In the summer of love, 1997, they divided up their operations. Um, they swapped systems and regionalized their clusters. So each major metropolitan air area in, in the United States is covered by a single incumbent cable provider with absolutely no one uh, coming after them. So they can raise prices. Uh, one guy said to me recently when I was doing the interview, Comcast owns the internet. You know, it's relegated to a couple of channels, virtual channels, uh, of the hundreds that are provided for uh, the paid TV services. And, um, you know, they can do whatever they want. They can slice, dice, prioritize, monetize. And so the problem is um, when Verizon steps back from competing with cable, net neutrality becomes this tiny issue. Who cares about that? Now we're dealing with one pipe one pipe for news, information, a little bit of internet access, everything that reaches Americans, where the cable guys will have the power to charge more, as they already do, for naked internet access. They'll make it cheaper if you sign up for their cable services, and they'll make the non-cable version of anything quite unattractive, right? So that's a tremendous policy issue for the country. Now Comcast, which is the nation's largest broadband provider, third largest phone company, Right, and largest cable provider, um, wants to merge with one of the five oligopolies that provide content in this country. Uh, and they will control a huge chunk of viewing hours. Um, it, you know, it looks as if uh, the Department of Justice and the FCC are close to finishing up their review of that merger. And it also looks as if it's going to go through. Uh, Comcast will be this vertic vertically integrated giant company that will be able to use this very popular programming to make it very difficult for any other aggregator of online video to compete. How will they do this? By selling their TV Everywhere service online, the Comcast service, at a price that's effectively zero. Uh, because they'll be bundling the TV Everywhere service with their cable service. So for most Americans who subscribe to cable, 
this will feel like a free thing they get online that comes from Comcast, all the content they want. Sports, in particular, drives the power of this transaction. People can't live without sports. Comcast controls a lot of sports um, and is going to be able to uh, keep people subscribing and they won't be able to cut the cord. It's in Comcast's interest to make this merger seem absolutely inevitable. And they've hired sort of man-on-man -man, man defense. They've hired almost 100 government employees, former government employees, to lobby the people they used to work for to make sure this thing goes through. Um, and they're hiring and firing and cleaning house at NBC uh, in preparation for the merger to be over. Um, we only have a few media conglomerates, and uh, Comcast believes that this increased participation in content will delay the day when their pipe is just a pipe. Um, and the question is whether this unconditioned merger is in the public interest. My worry is that it really isn't, but that given the political influence of Comcast and their ability to uh, you know, throw the same armies at this issue that were thrown at this relatively minor issue of reclassification, uh, looks as if uh, the, the whole thing will go through with very little interruption. And that will enable Comcast to build a moat of comparative advantages around its cable system that no competing online provider will be able to uh, fight against. Nobody will show up and give you fast, neutral, non-discriminatory internet access in a market where Comcast already operates because it just won't be worth their while. You'll have no other choice. So I'm spending a lot of my energy and time um, thinking about this. I, I really do think the merger is a fight over the future of the internet. That uh, it's in the interests of the giant programmers as well as the distributors to avoid a future that includes a commodity transport function where their own businesses can't be confident of you know, slicing, dicing, pricing in ways that uh, make them the most money possible. Um, so they're, they're maintaining that cord cutting isn't happening. You know, can't be happening because everybody wants this uh, content. And they, they want to make us expect high-priced, uh, densely bundled, single source communications, not very interactive, as the future of how we do things in America. So that's why they want this merger. So what is the country supposed to do? What's a supervisor supposed to do? And it's, I think, useful to remember um, what the progressives were thinking about when they even set up the FCC. The idea was to have an autonomous expert and agency, not subject to the political winds sweeping through Washington, that would make you know, technical expert decisions about the industries that, that were sitting in front of them. Uh, the problem we have at the moment is that supervision of this central communications facility is almost entirely lacking. And I want to contrast that with the situation in Australia, which was just reported over the weekend. Um, the Australian economy is, is booming. It's, they've got good mining in, interests and commodities, but they have a real problem with information technology infrastructure. And they're 16th in internet um, deployments among the OECD nations, and they have very expensive communication services. So uh, Minister Stephen Conroy, starting in 2005, took it on as a mission to deploy a public high-speed internet access fiber network throughout Australia at a cost of $38 billion. It's going to reach every Australian. And just this past weekend, Senate in Australia passed a bill that divides their incumbent monopoly operator into transport and everything else and makes that transport available to the public for use in building out this fiber network, right? One gig speeds to 93% of Australians are coming. That's very fast and that kind of leadership and initiative seems unthinkable right now in America. I mean, not even talking about supervision, but you know, the vision to make something happen like this um, seems impossible. And Conroy's idea is that breaking up this giant company is going to yield better competitive services, better pricing, and a better future for the entire country. Thomas Kuhn uh, writes about the progress of science. You all know about this in the 1950s, saying that uh, it proceeds in the following fashion. There, there's a lot of normal science that's done around central organizing ideas, and everybody works on that. And then suddenly, someone comes up with some new theory, like the theory of relativity, and everything shifts. And that's a paradigm shift. Here, the, what's happening in Australia, and has already happened in Chattanooga, 
and other parts of America where the municipalities have just given up on the private actors. What's happening in Australia is a paradigm shift, is an important moment for telecommunications policy around the world. It's going to be very interesting to see how our own country reacts to this. Our sense of humor is very like the Australian sense of humor. Even our country is like Australia. People live on the coasts, don't live so much in the interior. So I wonder if we're going to pay any attention to this at all. In the telecom sector, just to wrap up here, we're facing the banking problem. There are similarities. The companies involved are extraordinarily wealthy, and they're all working together these days, the programmers and the distributors. So where Disney's CEO makes you know, $24 million a year, CBS $43 million a year, Comcast is way in the lead too. Brian Roberts collected almost $30 million last year, and Steve Burke, 34. There's an entire industry set up to help them. There are people writing economic reports, being paid as consultant, being hired as lobbyists. And their tab for the merger will run north of $100 million to make sure this goes through. Another source of power is their power to guarantee that people, as they come out of government, find jobs in the telecommunications sector. And again, all the people with the relevant data are outside the regulator. We don't have accurate pricing data inside the FCC that would tell us what the real story is. Wall Street's positions on telecommunications policy have become conventional wisdom in Washington. They are the way of thinking. And the leadership Australia is showing is, seems unthinkable here. So just one last thought for you. It's worth reflecting that the top political contributor in the United States between uh, 1989 and 2010 is not Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs is fifth. And Verizon and Comcast are in the top 50. But the very, very top political contributor in the United States from 1989 to 2010 was who? AT&T. So that's all I have to say. Long there. Any questions? Yes. Um, Verizon, I guess it was last week, called for a rewrite of the Communication Act. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts on that? So basically, starting from scratch. I think everybody agrees we need to start from scratch. The problem is that we're, that takes a long time. And this reclassification move I've been talking about could be in place while we do that rewrite. It, I, I, everybody agrees it has to happen. It was written before the internet showed up. Right. Before and the What's that? Before the transistor. Before the transistor. It's true. It's true. Yes. Uh, I saw the inside job too. What I came away from was that um, I, I really came to the realization that Obama really was our hope, like in a lot of ways, to kind of come in and change it on that foundation level because we're so wrapped up in the trap right now and so much money's involved. And really, it is a whole new start. You were part of you know the administration for a while. Do you? Do you see, I mean, because it's, it's hard on the outside to really understand what the inner workings are like. Do you, do you is that hope still alive? Is, that, is he still in that same mindset? Or, because the movie indicated that the people he brought up on his team were all the same people who screwed the whole thing up in the first place. So I, I don't know if we all got tricked or if there's actually, if there's actually a, a plan or still that desire to fix it. That's a big question. I know. Um, <laughs> Some people said that Obama won the election, but Clinton won the transition. Uh, that uh, there, because you need pe experienced people, you really do need experienced people to get in there. There is nothing like starting a government from scratch. It's amazing. There's no phone directory. No one knows what's going on. So it's very useful to have people in there with experience. Um, that being said, the reaction to the pressures of these giant industries it depends on leadership. It depends on um, the you know the step being taken by the people at the top. Uh, I will say there are people of goodwill and people of tremendous hope throughout the administration, and particularly on these technology policy issues. There are lots of people who understand this stuff, um, but but they need uh, leadership to, um, or they need to feel as if they are acting in the best interests of their leader in order to take the right steps. And do you think they feel that way? I think these two things I just identified, the reclassification decision and what happens on Comcast NBC, are very telling moments for the Obama administration in this area. So, yeah. 
I get the feeling that it is somewhat poisonous in Washington to bring up examples from abroad, even though we have such wonderful ones. Yeah. Um, I also wonder sometimes why our political system doesn't have a shadow cabinet the way Britain does that might ease transition. But can you talk why, for example, bringing up this example of Australia and structural separation might be so easily ignored in Washington? Well, uh, the easy response to the Australia story is that they were dealing with a single incumbent, Telstra, who had a lock on the entire country. And that uh, and everybody was mad, right? <laughs> everybody. So uh, all the businesses are mad, the regulators mad, you know, the other potential competing uh, transport providers are mad. We have a different context in this country where um, we have the appearance of competition between cable and telephone and wireless. We don't actually have competition. Um, but, but the easy response is to say, no, that's, that's different. They're dealing with an old fashioned incumbent. This is the new era, very different here in America. Yeah. Um, the comparison of the financial industry versus here, the one thing that strikes me in, in the financial sector, right? At least until the music stopped, everyone was happy, everyone was making money, from the, the individual yeah. owner all the way up to the CEO of a global entity. And they were all about, they were all looking for the same set of policies to get cheap credit and all that stuff. Here, it seems like there should be a set of wealthy moneyed interests in favor of net neutrality, in favor of open access, in favor of these things. Whether it's the, you know, you know I mean, Google and Microsoft, these companies aren't, aren't exactly, you know, poor. So, so, where are they? Where where are the content providers that are want to make sure they, you know, where's the, the news corp versus uh, cable vision battle, you know, that resulted in people like if you watch public? Like, where is that in all of this discussion? And, and then also, for places that don't have cable vision as their service provider, what does the cable vision net NBC merger mean for them? Okay, well, there, lot, thank you for that question. Lots of good stuff buried in there. Um, Let's start with the why aren't programmers saying anything about these nasty distributors? It's because they all do well if the cable monopoly stays in place. Here's why. There are tens of billions of dollars flowing from distributors to programmers for affiliate fees for their cable. This is really all about cable uh, channels. And so they get lots and lots of money. There's also retransmission consent money going from the cable providers to the programmers. So for all of them, it is not in their interest to break ranks. Because uh, if you get Comcast angry at you, you've just lost distribution to more than a quarter of the country. And you can't afford that if you're depending on all these tens of billions of dollars to show up. So there's a lot of fear out there. Actually, I've interviewed many programmers, independent programmers, who say, you cannot overestimate the fear people have in dealing with Comcast. Because they, you know, you tick these guys off, that's it, you're dead. Your business plan will never take off. So um, part of that is uh, just if, if there becomes an opportunity to show a programmer that online distribution, without going through this middleman, is actually viable for some portion of their plan, that might make a difference. Right now, though, Comcast and other distributors have agreements with programmers saying you will never sell your programming to anybody else at less than you sell it to us. It's a most favored nation clause in reverse, in essence. So they can't actually afford to do private distribution, not through a cable distributor online. Kind of complicated, but the only thing you have to keep in mind is that their interests are aligned. In it, only where you have a very small distributor, like Cablevision is relatively small. Um, it can be beaten up by Fox, but most of the other guys are in rough parity. So you've got big old Time Warner content and big old Time Warner cable, and they kind of uh, get along. But the whole thing is not necessarily good for Americans. It's uh, this idea that you know rates keep going up, we pay more and more. The average American household pays more than $100 a month for cable. That can't be right. You know, it's tremendously expensive. Okay, so that's one point. Then you say, well, what about all these big companies who might have an interest in doing something about net neutrality and everything? Well, if you're a very large company, you don't want to point to another monopoly and say, go regulate them. <laughs> <laughs> because you're under pressure in Washington at your level for your practices. So uh, there's a sort of concern about that. <coughs> that makes it difficult for people to be active. 
So, yeah. And with thought away from time goals leaving, voucher leaving, and people like Bobby Rush coming in, yeah. uh, and the positions that she's looking to take, do you think there's a chance that we're not going to get into anything because Congress steps in? Because I know a lot of the money's not just in the MCC, a lot of it's going in to these people who have the power to just stop it legislatively. And um, following up with that is if we can't do something uh, as far as this merger, the antitrust issues, unfair competition issues, is there anything to check it in other areas of law outside the regulations? Yeah, that's true. Well, yes, there are lots of people moving around the House. I don't think anything is going to get through the Senate. So, you know, I think the worst the House can do to the FCC is to investigate them, which they're going to do. See Daryl Issa in the New York Times? He's just ready to go. So there will be investigations, but what the heck? You know, we've been through that before, and the Commission could act nonetheless. Um, and you shouldn't be managing an agency in the public interest, in the public interest, in order to avoid litigation. You know, litigation risk should not be your primary motivating factor in running things. So, um, and I ran into that in the ICANN context too. There was always a lot of concern, oh, we're gonna get sued. Yep, so what? We're doing the right thing, right? And Americans can sue over anything. It doesn't mean you don't do it. Um, okay, I'm upset about that. So I, I do think that it's, it's uh, the Senate remaining in Democratic hands means that there's not much that's actually gonna happen if the commission acts on reclassification. Did you ask a second question? Yeah, I was also wondering about outside of um, this tech regulation. Oh, antitrust with Comcast. Yeah. Yes, oh yeah, the Department of Justice is working closely, they've said publicly, with the Federal Communications Commission on this, on this merger. Uh, but the, you know, the public interest ambit of the FCC is much broader than the antitrust ambit of the DOJ in some ways. So uh, there, they have to work together, and uh, what I'm hoping is that they come out with pretty fierce market structure uh, limitations on Comcast. But who knows what's going to happen in the political melee that's about the to happen? FTC. What's that? And the FTC. The FTC does not have a role. What happens is uh, DOJ and FTC both have antitrust authority, but they they divide up cases between them. So, and this one was allocated to the Department of Justice, not to the FTC. Yeah. Um, from your experience, what would be the best way to make our voices most effectively heard? You, know, you, you see, you see, you know, people talk as far as like this is what's happening and this is what's happening. Right. What is the most effective way to get somebody's ear and actually cause change? Uh, it's a difficult question. That's one reason I started One Web Day was be to get people to see each other and you know be able to act collectively because we have a real collective action problem when it comes to individual American citizens acting on these issues. There are advocacy groups that are doing their best. Um, uh, public Knowledge is one. Publicknowledge.org uh, is very active on these issues, and you can go and join them and write to them and represent things to them. Uh, Free Press does a lot. Freepress.net. Uh, but I, I think this is actually a gap. I, I am worried that there is not an easy way. You know, you could file a comment with the FCC. Anybody can do that. But whether that gets heard or is, rep or is recognized as coming from an important stakeholder, I'm not so sure. I think it's difficult. Yeah. Both, <clears throat> both you and Tim Wu, who are sort of leading exponents of net neutrality, have both moved on to a, a, a separation principle kind of concept mm -hmm. and free press and public knowledge are still kind of going on about net neutrality. They're still talking about the internet mm -hmm. and not the infrastructure. Do you think that they'll be following you along this track? Oh, that's interesting. It's a nice question. I, you know, free press and public knowledge have to deal with the possible in Washington and they have to maintain relationships with the regulators. So, you know, right now structural separation is not possible. But, it, but you guys have moved on. Yeah, but you we're were academics. You were <laughs> <laughs> and this is why it's great to be an academic, because I, I know this is the right policy outcome. I really do. But, but in the current context, the way the game is played, and the way the world has turned upside down in Washington, it is unthinkable that this would actually happen right now. I've got a second question. You know, okay. in the Comcast uh, Fox thing, we saw them restrict Hulu to the to the Philadelphia people, so they couldn't see the, their sports game. 
we see ESP then 360, which in order to see that, you know, your ISP has to subscribe to it. So in essence, when you get the ISPs are move, they're forcing the ISPs to move over to the cable model. When you buy transport, you're paying for content which you don't necessarily want to watch like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's going to hit people in the pocketbook. And do you think this will raise awareness? And what do you think about this as a niche? Uh, what do I think? I, I think that uh, Hulu is an interesting case uh, because um, it's a third owned by NBC. And so Chromecast takes an interest in it and can change its future. And, uh, you know, the ability of these services to do things like block Google TV and make sure that Roku and other boxes can't work with them is pretty important. Um, I think that uh, what I'm hoping for is wiggle room, a little breathing space for really successful, even subscription-based online services. I'm not so bugged by ESPN 360 uh, because it's something you can choose to pay for. But you don't, uh -huh. your ISP can choose to pay for it. You just pay. That's true. You might be paying some small amount because your ISP is subscribed. That's why this whole thing needs to be. You don't have choice right. as a user. You know, right. Your ISP yeah. chooses not to subscribe. Right. I think I'm out of time, right? It's 4.30 or? Uh, we have till 4.45. OK. All right. Uh, over here, this quadrant. Yes. Uh, so two questions. Uh, so basically, I'm kind of cynical, and I have almost no hope that Washington is going to do the right thing in this case. I don't think our political system is up to this challenge. I hate to say it, but I'm just that cynical, especially after the recent elections. Uh, is there uh, any sort of free market solution? For example, a few years ago, Google bought up a bunch of um, recently freed up um, wireless space. I forgot from the SEC. They've been on it. I don't remember what the conclusion of that was, but I don't know if that's going to help the situation. Well, actually, that auction, uh, Google had set the rules for that auction, Okay. but Verizon got the spectrum. And Verizon and AT&T uh, have far more you know, capacity, spectrum capacity, than any other carrier. So they're way ahead. So, But you're right to raise the idea of, you know, what about Google doing something? The, the whole idea of the 100, you know, 100 megabit service uh, the trial that Google is, I, you know, they had a contest. They want to announce what municipality won. I was until recently living in Ann Arbor, which got all excited about this and said, we want this. So, I, you know, uh, that's exciting and disruptive. It's disruptive to see what is possible without relying on these guys. I think it, so that's interesting. Another thing that's interesting is municipalities taking the, this on for themselves. And that's why I mentioned Chattanooga, because there, the electrical power utility decided we're going to provide fiber to the city. Take a look at what they've been able to do. And they've got very fast, uh, very cheap service for all of their citizens. So where the situation is, is, you know, local may work better than national. But what I'm worried about is that, you know, we should be one country. There should be an ability for, just as we have telephone service to all Americans, we should have the same thing for high-speed internet access. OK, one more question. OK, well, the last thing is the worst case. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. no, go ahead. The worst case scenario, assuming nothing happens and Comcast gets its way and there's no net neutrality anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, you know, especially if you consider like Europe as part of the equation and Japan and South Korea, like what do you think is going to happen in terms of the internet in America? Uh, <sighs> well, just we can do a really worst case scenario. Like we never moved to IPv6. We never have really high speed connections, and we become this sort of forgotten island nation. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm afraid this might be a rather obscure question, but inspired by your comment about everyone having one phone number. Um, or access to phones, that's more. Yeah. yeah. My question is I'm wondering if there's any discussion going on in the circles here in Washington about the nature of services, how managed services have evolved um, in terms of things like only being web services and email being offered and all these other services that we have kind of baked into a lower level are now being pushed up to the, that enhanced level and a lot of this seems to revolve around, I believe it was Daniel Berenger who was it? Was it called? Who? Oh, there we go, right there. <laughs> You can probably finish this question, but I think it was Daniel that, that pointed out the way that the, um, those services are controlled and you know, service level of the records, the grade records, the MX records are defined, but everything else is pushed outside of that, that protocol. So I'm just wondering, um, excuse me, I was going to talk to Daniel afterwards, but I was wondering if there was any discussion going on in your circles with this or in Washington, or if this is, this is actually a, a real issue that's being discussed or if it's more some 
I know you want that back uh, down. Okay, you want to? Well, that topic is getting discussed, and, and that has to do with moving addressing over to an email style addressing. So everyone has an email address, and you can now use that for voice, you can use it for Twitter, you can use right, it for Facebook. <laughs> and so there's, there is discussion about that. Yeah. Let, me, let me answer one question. Somebody asked what you can do. Okay, look, I think that on the 21st of December there's going to be some sort of meeting in Washington. Yes. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay, now, anybody comes to this and doesn't go to that, say, well, I'm a dilettante, I don't really care. They can go and do whatever they want, because they pay people to get in the office every day at 8 o'clock, often work late, and very well paid. It's very effective to go and talk to Jim Chelsea. And if I were speaking to him, I'd say, are you on the other side? Or are you just so chicken shit <laughs> that you can't stand up because you've got no spine? Nothing is going to happen to you, and people will love you if you just say, look, it's a telecommunications service. I've got my three guys here. So you write some op-ed pieces against me. And by the way, if you said that, more than half of the Tea Party members would be in his side when he pointed out that this will prevent people from wiretapping their private communications and work to overthrow the tyranny of the United States, which of course is important. It's my main interest in net neutrality. So you're going to overthrow the United States government. I want to know the method of private communication. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks. Yeah. Um, just a, a quick note. You mentioned the inside job. I don't know if you know that Charles Ferguson, who made that movie, also wrote a book about called the broadband problem a couple of years ago. You know, he started front with front page and sold. I actually did know that. I yeah. did know that. It's called the broadband problem, and essentially he he identified this duopoly that we're left with at currently as a threat to innovation, mm -hmm. and that's really what is at stake here. If you are the next Skype or service like that, Verizon and AT and T have a reason to block that protocol. If you, are, if you are Comcast, you have a reason to block other competing video services. You may call it managing your network against BitTorrent, but, and you do have a, you also have a technological problem because they do have a problem with, with overload on the upstream path. I don't know how we get to structural separation either, but uh, that's the only, it seems like that's the only solution right now mm -hmm. for, for innovation, but it's a, an economic argument about innovation being the driver yeah. for our economic future. And I don't know who else can make it. Maybe Charles Ferguson wants to turn that book into a movie, too. <laughs> we need more movies. Go ahead. Yeah. Anybody else? All right, well. All right, well, thank, thank you all. Thank you.